Okay, probably a couple of years ago you realized that a lot of the refugees coming up uh, from Syria and uh, North Africa were, um, were communicating, were using technology in an interesting way to find their way around a lot of the border uh, patrols, uh, a lot of the hurdles that were put up in their way. Uh, in the US, we have a uh, similar issue, but it's different in many ways, uh, with illegal immigrants trying to stay underneath the radar. Um, Allison McDonald from uh, the University of Michigan is, uh, has been studying uh, how immigrants in the, sta in the States deal with technology, and it's very different from here. Her interests are in uh, technology, privacy, society, and human rights, and I think we're going to have an awesome talk from her, so uh, we'll, please welcome her, and uh, we'll get moving. Okay, um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Allison from the University of Michigan. I'm talking today primarily about um, technology in immigration enforcement and specifically about how the immigrant community in the United States is responding to those changes, um, and especially the undocumented community. Um, before we get too far into the details, I just wanted to tell a little bit of a story. Uh, this is Anna Maria. She is not a real person. She's sort of a composite of, of many people that we spoke to, um, but her story is really representative of, of a lot of people that, um, that we know are living in the United States today. Um, she and her husband immigrated from Mexico about 12 years ago into the United States. Uh, she really wanted to have children, but uh, couldn't get the fertility support that she needed in Mexico, so she came to the United States. And now she and her husband have two children who are uh, attending U.S. public schools. Um, she and her husband are both working and saving up to, to buy a house. They pay taxes, they attend church every Sunday. Um, they're involved in a lot of community events and are really integrated into, into the local community. Um, one difference uh, from Anna Maria and a lot of other people is that um, she's in the, in the United States as an undocumented immigrant. What this means is that um, she either entered the United States without legal authorization or she came on a visa and overstayed um, the allotted time. That means that um, Day to day, she has to worry about being found and uh, deported back to Mexico, um, removed from her home, uh, and this puts her in quite a precarious situation, um, trying to live a normal life, uh, a life similar to a lot of other people in our communities, um, but with this, this constant concern that um, this life could be taken away from her if she's detected. Other than this, this one point, she really lives this immigration story that the United States loves to tell. Um, we, we love to have this narrative of people being able to come to the United States and build lives for themselves that they might not be able to build in their, in their origin countries. And that's exactly what she's done. Um, but just as, as natural to this immigration story, um, is a history of a lot of discrimination, race, racism, and xenophobia. Um, all the way back in the, the 1700s, we've had uh, legislation that prevents people from becoming citizens uh, based on their origin country. Um, we've had, uh, for example, the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act preventing people from China, um, laborers coming to the United States entirely. Um, the Asiatic Bard Zone, a couple of years later, just drew a box on a map and said the people in this region can't immigrate to the United States. Um, we've also seen things like the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act in the 1900s, where um, the, the U.S. took census data from before a big wave of, of immigra immigration, um, putting a quota system in place that essentially prevented people from Eastern and Southern Europe from coming to the United States. Um, this history of, of discrimination and racism continues to today. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of what's happening now with the, the so-called Muslim ban, where 
a list of seven countries are, are now blacklisted, immigrants are, are unable to enter the country. Um, and this is just a, another data point to show the, the trend that our, our discourse and immigration policy in the United States is often racialized. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what immigration enforcement actually looks like in the United States. Um, the, the agency that manages enforcement is called the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. They, um, they're in charge of, of enforcing within the borders, once people have already entered the country, um, finding people without documentation or managing immigration cases. Um, over the last couple of decades, they've really been gaining in, in size and power. This is anything from uh, the removal of privacy restrictions on sharing data between federal agencies to um, a, an increase in, in uh, financial resources after 9-11. Um, and this is happening uh, even today. President Trump, back in January, uh, had an executive order that is looking to add another 5,000 agents to their current 20,000 um, over the next couple of years. So this is an agency that's continuing to be bolstered. Um, and another way that they're changing recently is the way that they're integrating technology into their jobs. Um, this photo in particular shows a, a fingerprint scanner. Uh, the collection of biometric data is becoming really common in immigration enforcement. Um, and it's not just when someone's taken into an immigration office, um, but mobile fingerprint scanners are being taken into communities. There are stories of people having their, their biometric data taken even without arrest, um, being stopped in the street, or, or being near someone who's, who's being detained for a particular reason, everyone in the area or everyone in the household having their biometric data taken. We've also seen um, the removal of some restrictions on how this data can be shared between federal agencies. Uh, in particular, uh, President, uh, President Trump has reinstated the Secure Communities uh, program, which allows local police officers, when they're booking people for local crimes um, or in, in local uh, jails, to take biometric data and cross-check it against federal immigration databases and crime databases. We're also seeing evidence that, um, so DHS is the Department of Homeland Security, the umbrella organization over ICE. Um, we have recently seen uh, through a freedom of information request that this organization has used uh, cell site simulators or stingrays um, over 1,800 times in the last five years. We don't know all of the cases where these have been used. Um, and we really can't speculate. These, these cases are shrouded in secrecy, and we don't know when and how they're being used. But we do have one case that's actually close to my home in Detroit, Michigan, where an undocumented man, um, ICE was able to send a warrant to Facebook to get his phone number and then use that phone number uh, with a cell site simulator to track him to his home and ended up deporting him to El Salvador. We're also seeing this move to start collecting um, social media data at the borders. Uh, this isn't just for people on temporary visas, uh, but also naturalized citizens and people with permanent res residency cards. Um, this might not be so relevant to people who are already in the country because they're not crossing the border regularly, um, but this might be impactful if they have friends and family crossing borders to visit them um, and new immigrants as well. Uh, this is a, a database that we don't really know what it's being used for yet, um, but there are some hints uh, in the way that, for example, um, ICE has been soliciting contracts from big uh, data companies to create algorithms to do this extreme vetting to be able to find suspicious activity or suspicious people from troves of social media data. In fact, we have already seen some of these contracts being awarded. Uh, there was a three million contract recently given to a company called Giant Oak, who uh, claims to take big data and find bad guys. They're 
creepy slogans, uh, we see the people behind the data, trademark, and um, this is uh, just another example of the way that technology is being used to, um, in ways that are sort of unpredictable at this point, but have, we have many examples where this style of, uh, of research can often be uh, discriminatory. And it might be expected that at this point in time, technology is ending up integrated into law enforcement in the way that it's being integrated into a lot of different parts of our lives. But there's a reason that this moment in particular is so frightening. Um, this administration's making it abundantly clear what they think of immigration. Um, just in less than a year so far, we've seen the repeal of um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, which you might also hear as the DREAM Act, or, or people here talking about dreamers. Um, this is a program that allowed people who entered the country under the age of 16 to get work permits and driver's licenses and attend university and have their, um, their immigration cases delayed um, so long as they're meeting educational goals. Um, We've seen the elimination of privacy protections from um, sharing data between federal agencies. And um, in addition to the, to the actual concrete policy changes, we're hearing a lot of really nasty rhetoric around immigrants and immigration um, that's causing a lot of concern among people who are in the immigrant community or who are allies to the immigrant community about what this means in terms of harassment and hatred. Um, even beyond the, the legal changes. We're also seeing a change in, in deportation practices. Um, while Obama was prolific in deportations, um, he had a very explicit policy in place that the priority deportations would be people who were national security threats, whatever that might mean, or people with serious criminal records, or people who had just recently entered the United States. Um, that policy is being removed, and we're seeing more and more people who are deported after living in the, in the United States for a long time um, with family and friends and lives built in the communities um, who might have family or children who are U.S. citizens who don't have criminal records. So what does this mean for Anna Maria? For one, without a criminal record, she previously might have been able to have some high amount of confidence that she wouldn't be a priority target. And that confidence is being eroded. Um, we're seeing lots of people who previously weren't, wouldn't have been targeted be deported regardless of their clean record and, and lack of... of action that really makes them more visible than they have been in the past. She and her husband are starting to think about what happens to, the, to their children if they're deported. They have to make the decision, because the children were born in the United States, they're U.S. citizens. Um, they have to decide whether they should give custody to friends and family who can stay in the United States, or if they should take them back to Mexico um, rather than letting them stay and get the U.S. education that they want to have. She has to be concerned about ICE being in her community and outside of her home, um, possibly having her fingerprints taken if she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, she might have to worry about friends and family from Mexico visiting and crossing the border and having social media data taken from them that, I mean, as we all know, might indicate a, a lot more than just about the person who's crossing the border, our, our social media lives give a lot of information about our networks that might expose information about her. It's also worth noting that Anna Maria is far from alone. There are as many as 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States today. Over two-thirds of them have been in the United States for more than 10 years, which means they're integrated into our communities. They own houses, they have jobs, they pay taxes, they live really normal lives uh, to the extent that they can. Um, in the United States, they've built their lives here. So, with this context in mind, um, I and some of my collaborators were wondering, 
how this is really changing the way that people use technology, or if it is, um, given the sort of objectively heightened risk that they're facing day to day, um, we wanted to know whether or not there's any sort of reaction to those changes happening um, in their daily lives. We uh, reached out to some uh, immigration support organizations, so immigrant rights and, and activist organizations, and worked with them to be able to communicate with this community. Um, in the end, we were able to talk to 17 undocumented immigrants in the Midwest. Um, we were primarily asking them about how they manage risk in their daily lives offline as well as online, and whether or not that's changing over the last year or, or two years when this discourse around immigration is really changing, and then whether these changes that we're seeing are, are causing them to maybe react um, in the way that they're using technology. I can tell you a little bit about who we spoke to. Um, the majority were women. 14 of our 17 participants were women. Um, most of them were in their mid-30s, uh, average age 35, and, and lots of them had children, so it was a lot of parents. Um, everyone that we spoke to had been in the United States for more than 10 years, so they really had their lives and their communities here. Um, and most of them were also from Mexico. That's about consistent with the immigrant community in the United States, especially from Latin America. Uh, the majority are from Mexico. And then there was a mix of, of immigration stories. Some of the people we spoke to had crossed the southern border um, by foot or otherwise, and some people had overstayed visas, had flown to the United States and stayed. So we wanted to first get an idea of how they're managing and, and sort of thinking about risk in their daily lives offline um, to get a, an, a sense of how deeply it impacts the way that they're living. Um, what we found across the board is that immigration is a really sort of looming presence in their lives. They think a lot about how they're exposing themselves and that possibly exposing their status to authority figures. Um, and, and they put like a lot of careful consideration into how to keep a low profile. Driving is one really good example of, of this cost risk, um, cost benefit analysis that they're doing. Um, most people we spoke to talked about driving one way or another and about half chose to drive and half chose not to. Um, most of the people don't have driver's licenses for the United States because um, it's difficult to get them without legal immigration papers. Um, so the risk with driving is that if you're stopped, if you're pulled over, even if you didn't have a traffic violation, uh, if you're stopped for a taillight or something, the routine is to ask for, for a documentation of, of your license. And if you don't have that, there might be more questions. And in the end, you could expose yourself to immigration or, or other legal um, law enforcement. Uh, some people really thought that the risk was worth it to, to live their, their lives how they want to. They're going to try to just not think about the risk and do what they need to do day to day. Other people felt that the risk was too great um, and chose not to drive at all. And that's a significant sacrifice, especially in the United States where our public transportation systems aren't fantastic. Uh, this might mean that they can't set their own work schedules or they can't take their kids to school if they miss the bus. Um, so it's a significant risk, but it's also a big sacrifice if they choose not to drive. People also think a lot about how they're exposing themselves to authority figures. Um, as one example, um, the decision to file taxes or not is a big risk. So in the United States, you don't need, um, you don't need to have any sort of government ID to file taxes. You just need a tax ID. So a lot of these people are filing taxes. Um, but in order to do that, they are giving up to the federal government their names, their addresses, their employment history, contact information. Um, and some people think that that risk is worth it, right? Because this person, for example, feels like by paying taxes every year, they're able to establish a, a good uh, history of, of up upstanding behavior. They can maybe have a better case for getting a legal status if the time comes when that's an option. Um, 
And another example of, um, you know, exposing information to authorities might be uh, filing for, for benefits for U.S.-born children or even library cards or, or local ID cards. Um, and the risk is going to be different in each case depending on what they're exposing. Some people chose to forego significant benefits to avoid giving that information to authorities. Um, this person is talking about DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program. Um, this would make it much easier for their son to go to college, give their son, hopefully, if they trust the program, a much more reliable immigration status. They wouldn't technically have a legal immigration status, but they would be um, sort of assured that their status, or rather their immigration case is a low priority. They wouldn't be targeted. And as long as they're attending universities, they could have confidence. So the program says that, that they wouldn't be targeted. Um, th these people were concerned because in order to file that, that paperwork for their son, they had to give up a lot of information about themselves, their phone numbers, their names, their addresses. And um, in the end, they decided not to do it. And unfortunately, only weeks after we spoke to this person, the DACA program was repealed. Um, this has led a lot of people to be concerned because the people who did apply for the program have given that information to the government, to immigration services in particular. And at this point in time, we have no assurances that that information won't be used in immigration cases. Uh, at, the, at the moment, there's just a sort of FAQ page that, say, that says we, we don't use this information now, but we reserve the right to change that at any time without telling anyone. People are also really feeling the changes that are happening in the last couple of months. Well, it's been too many months, the last year and a half. Um, they're feeling the pressure in their communities for uh, immigration services being or immigration enforcement being more present um, and less predictable. Uh, one person described um, feeling like instead of coming to take a particular person, they're just coming and looking for anyone who might be undocumented. Um, many people that we spoke to had negative experiences with ICE, including if it weren't if they hadn't had the experience themselves, lots of people had friends and family who had negative experiences, um, and they're feeling this increase in presence of enforcement in their communities. And this is leading them to make significant changes to the way that they're living their lives. Um, for example, one person we spoke to talked about how they won't leave their child at home alone anymore because they're worried that while they're out, their child... Um, if, if they're picked up while they're out and the child's at home alone, they might be left there. Or ICE might even show up at the house while the child's there alone. They don't want either of those things to happen. So people are changing a lot of the ways that they, that they live day to day, and this is a very present concern in the way that they talk about um, their daily lives. So we were wondering if this is true when they think about the way that they use technology and what they're doing online. Um, First, let me just give you an overview of what sort of technologies they primarily use. Um, this community is really mobile heavy. Uh, some people had computers in the home. A lot of people had access to computers through local libraries and things, but everyone had a smartphone and they were very dependent on it. Um, some people used email, but when they spoke about email, it was mostly to do with um, communicating with their kids' schools or doctor's appointments. It wasn't really a social thing. So the majority of what we spoke to people about were social media tools. In particular, um, all but one of our participants were active users of Facebook. Um, most people were using WhatsApp uh, and Facebook Messenger as well. These are the three primary tools that people had the most to say about. Um, there were some other tools that they were on, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and, and Snapchat. But really the overarching um, sort of sense that people had about these tools is that it's bringing significant benefits to their daily lives, um, especially when you think about this community being separated permanently from a lot of their friends and family back home, um, or their, their former home, their origin country. Um, 
what they had to do before, maybe sending photos in the mail or through postcards, buying international calling cards, being able to call people with video chat now is a significant improvement to their ability to keep in touch with people back in, in, in Mexico or in wherever their, their origin country is. People also talked about how it's improving their lives in other ways. Um, for example, being able to organize their own work schedules and, and have more control over the way that they're um, employed. The, the benefits go on and on, and it's a lot of the same things that we've experienced over the last decade and the way that our lives have changed for the better because we're able to use these technologies. When we ask people about risk, um, the things that really pop into their heads first are hackers. Um, they're really concerned about fraud and identity theft, um, and they think a lot about their children contacting strangers on the internet or, or accessing inappropriate content. Um, but that's not to say that concerns related to their, to their status, their legal status, were absent. They're just um, much less certain. You know, um, it's easy to, to think about the, the consequences of, of identity theft. That's sort of concrete, but a lot of these um, status-related concerns were less, less concrete. Um, people talked about harassment as well being something that's increasing uh, in the real world as well as online. Um, in particular, participating in communities or in conversations online that maybe expose their immigration status. Um, this harassment has moved online. They're experiencing it in the real world as well, but. Um, they're, you know, they're hearing stories or having stories themselves about people threatening them with immigration enforcement. Um, that's, that's increasing over the last year or so. There are a couple of ways that people manage these risks. Um, primarily, what, what we found people really thought about as their, their concrete steps to managing their privacy online were fairly basic things like making sure that they only accept friends and family on Facebook. Um, they might have uh, set their profile to private, but they're really not fiddling with these more fine-grained privacy settings. They're not, you know, sharing particular posts only to particular people or using, that they were talking about, they didn't tell us about using these, like, private groups or anything like that to sort of create separate spheres of, of, of friends and family. Um, and channel management just in the sense that like, even though they had, they think about um, curating this like close network of friends and family, they're still really thoughtful about what they post in which, in which channel, um, whether like it's safe to put a photo, for example, on their wall or, it, you know, in their timeline versus sending it directly to family. Um, this person, for example, even after they post something publicly, publicly being, you know, within their Facebook, you know, wall, they'll still go back to a couple days later and just delete everything because they're not totally confident that that's private. Another really interesting thing is that in all of this, the conversations we had, um, no one really expressed the sense that they understood that um, they're really living on Facebook. Uh, the tools that they're using most, like almost exclusively, are all owned by the same company. Um, no one also expressed any sort of sense that these companies are entities in themselves that might have interest and in access to their data, um, much less one that cooperates with law enforcement. That concern didn't appear in any of our conversations. Um, they, they tend to think about these platforms as being sort of uh, a medium to communicate with other people. You know, the way that they use it is, is to talk to other individuals or groups of individuals, but the, the platform doesn't seem to be like a repository for data. Um, in fact, they're, they're expressing significant trust in Facebook, Facebook in particular. Um, a lot of people were grateful for the changes that Facebook's made over the last year or, to, uh, or two um, in terms of account management. So 
Um, they're grateful that if there's a suspicious login attempt, they'll be able to stop it. Um, that's helped a lot of people, and that sort of generates trust in these platforms. And this sense that Facebook really has their back. Um, in addition to sort of managing their, the way that they're sharing information, um, we did see some people choosing to abstain from sharing, um, especially when it came to topics around immigration. Um, some people chose to not join, um, you know, public Facebook groups or get information from certain places because they were afraid that by associating with these groups they might indicate something publicly about their status. Um, and that's frustrating for a lot of people who want to participate in these conversations, and especially because the discourse around immigration is so toxic in the United States. Um, to some people express this feeling that they, they have to just sit there and take this, this discourse happening around them without participating because they're worried about being targeted or harassed. Um, or maybe even like having physical consequences, being followed or being having immigration sent to their house if someone were to find them. Some people expressed the opposite, though, um, which is encouraging, right? Some people felt that even though the risk is there, they, it's more important for them to share their thoughts than it is for them to be tiptoeing around immigration enforcement. Um, this is also really interesting because this sort of exposes sometimes family tensions about these topics. Um, this is a really, it's a mixed status community, meaning that sometimes parents will be undocumented and children will be U.S. citizens, or lots of people have friends and family who have a different legal status than they do. So risk is really distributed. You know, it's not just individual. It's within families and within communities. And there can be a lot of tension between you know, children and parents or friends, you know, siblings, about how they share information on these platforms. Some, some people are much more conservative with what they share. Um, and this quote also reveals something else kind of interesting. Uh, when we talk to people about concerns about immigration, um, it's very rarely that they talk about whether immigration will be able to investigate them as much as it is about when. Um, which is this, this final point that there's really this sense of resignation in the community about what information uh, immigration enforcement has about them. Uh, lots of people feel like it doesn't really matter what they do. Uh, immigration can can know where they are and, and what they're doing. Um, they can find them if they just decide to. It's just a matter of whether immigration enforcement's gonna choose to come after them rather than whether they can. This is also true with the way that they think about technology. They have a sense that there's really no privacy. If, if immigration decided to, um, they would be able to see the messages on Facebook, um, they could see what was physically on their phones, um, that they have this sort of all-powerful, you know, toolkit to access their digital information. And honestly, this story in particular, this sense of surveillance comes from experience often. Um, this person had a really negative experience with, with ICE, you know, coming and talking to her family, and ICE knowing things that they hadn't told anyone. Somehow, they ICE had known things that they were keeping very private. And so there's this assumption that, well, it's happened to me before, I've seen it happen to my friends. They probably could know anything they want to. But it's not all negative. It's not all resignation. Um, another thing that we saw Many people, not everyone, but maybe half of the people we spoke to had this really strong sense that there was this responsibility to share things in the community to help each other. There's this growing sense of community identity. Um, and this might mean sharing information about um, resources for the immigrant community or sharing information about workshops or events, vigils. Um, 
but also information about immigration enforcement. If, if ICE is in a particular community, they might tell their friends and family, avoid this area until further notice. They're, they're helping each other. They're sending information. So it can't be total resignation. There's still this sort of beam of hope that they're helping each other. And they must have hope that they can do something because they are. And this, is, this has been something that has become faster and easier with technology too, right? It's much easier to, to send a message than it is to, to call or to spread information before we had, you know, smartphones. But all of this really leads to the question, considering how much they inconvenience themselves in their daily lives offline, why are they doing comparatively little online to change their practices or to, to reduce their visibility? Um, I don't think it's enough that although lots of people expressed this sense that they're like relatively low tech literate, um, that in and of itself isn't really enough of an explanation, right? Um, there are so many different factors into the way that they're making these decisions and they're thinking carefully about the decisions they do make. Um, so we have some thoughts on this. It really can be understated how much of a benefit technology is to this community. It's making a significant difference in the way that they, difference in the way that they live their lives. Um, so the choice to abstain is not trivial. Um, the risk that they're facing by using like Facebook, by putting phone numbers on Facebook or sharing photos of, of their family and friends and like building these online networks is really uh, the risk involved in that is uncertain, right? At this point, we have really sparse data about direct connections between the use of technology or the use of social media and immigration enforcement and consequences. Maybe that will change, but at this point, it's unclear which changes might be actually beneficial, right? Because there's not a direct connection between using this tool, putting this information online, and immigration enforcement showing up. There's also the significant trust in, in the platforms that they're using, um, and their peers are using as well. And there just tends to be less critical thought about the safety of using platforms when there's already this component of trust. Facebook has done a lot for um, account security, for example, over the last couple of years, and, and that's built trust in this community. Um, and as well as having you know, all of your community on a tool, when they're all there together, there's like less of a, less critical thought about whether they're, it, it's safe to be there. And there is this component of resignation. Um, when we sort of push people to think really explicitly about the risk with immigration enforcement, being and sharing information on social media or using technology, um, there was the sense that if they wanted to, they could have the information. I mean, they already have it in a lot of ways when they're filing taxes or, or just, you know, it's accessible to authorities um, is the general sense of regardless of what they do online. So this kind of in, in combination with the uncertain risk makes it really hard to make concrete steps towards changes that might be helpful. So, um, Finally, I just wanted to share a couple of things that I learned, especially as a, a digital security trainer in doing this, this study. Um, most importantly, everyone that we spoke to was really excited to learn. Um, that's just general like tech literacy, but also security and privacy. People really care, and they're excited. Um, and everyone expressed gratitude that we were talking to them about this topic. They're, they care a lot. Um, but so what was difficult for me, having a background in trainings, was uh, still being surprised by things that, in these conversations, that thinking I knew what they wanted or what they needed, uh, and that not being the case. So one thing I would say is, you know, don't assume that you know what's best for them or or even what they want or need, go and talk to people. They're really, um, you'll learn a lot from talking to people about what they think their risk is versus what they're doing. Um, for example, something that I was surprised to learn is that 
uh, they're really not using online resources when they have concerns about online privacy. Um, they're talking to their kids and they're talking to their neighbors and their friends. So for this community in particular, it would be really much more effective to go into uh, an in-person training, a training in Spanish in this case, or in the language that they're um, naturally speaking and have like in-person resources that will get you much further than you know compiling lists of of ideas or tools or or strategies um, that'll probably never be accessed. Um, and as a vehicle to do this, one we had a really positive experience working with support organizations um, on the front end that allowed us to build trust with the community. So by working with people who they already trusted and who already knew them well, um, I really think we were able to talk to people much more openly and much with much more trust than they would have otherwise. Whether they would have spoken to us at all is a question. Um, they also were a great, a great resource for us as we were developing um, interview materials and also like training materials afterwards um, when we went back to communities um, and uh, conducted digital trainings. Um, they helped us develop you know, culturally sensitive language and, and we were able to just ask, you know, is this location, is this style of presentation, is this length, is this time, what should we do? You know, they, they were a resource to us to make sure that the things that we were developing were most accessible to the people that we were talking to. And um, they also themselves, from what I've seen, have a lot of questions about the way that they're using technology. Uh, that's a great place to go and talk to people about, you know, organizational practices. Um, and you might find that it's a lot easier to get people to change their practices if they're in sort of an organizational setting where there's peer pressure or maybe some hierarchy of, of people who are really encouraging them to use more secure, more secure tools or to, to think carefully about data they're collecting about people that they contact. Um, so working with these organizations also might be an opportunity to do trainings with, um, with activists and with lawyers and with other people who are working alongside this community. Um, finally, uh, which is always a difficult uh, thing to hear as a trainer, um, the people we spoke to probably aren't going to be adopting new tools um, for one, it might not be safe. Um, it's hard to make that calculus, right? Um, but a tool that's specifically designed for um, a community at risk or in order to do a particular function that would be of interest to, for example, the undocumented community or some other vulnerable community might increase visibility depending on the threat model. Um, if they're found with a particular app or if the app is like exposing number of users or location of users, for example. Um, and it's not to say that we should stop developing new tools. We should always think about ways to make better and safer and more private um, resources. But it's worth thinking, especially if you're going to be working with communities or, or building resources for communities, that we should think also about how to make sure that they're using the tools they already use uh, more effectively and more safely. Um, that might mean sitting down with someone for a while and, and going through their privacy settings on Facebook or you know, making sure that their settings on WhatsApp make, don't back up data to the cloud or um, expose phone numbers to people they don't know. Um, but there's a lot to do in both of these directions. Uh, and especially if you're going to be moving into uh, working with these communities, this is something to keep in mind that um, I thought was especially poignant. Um, with that, I can take questions. So we have um, four microphones in this room. I see one is already occupied with somebody. May I remind you that a question is typically one to two sentences and ends with a question mark. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, take, we'll take microphone four. 
Hi, thanks. Oh. Um, you mentioned that these communities are reluctant to adopt new tools. Were there any exceptions to that, or were there any like attributes of new tools that you think they would be more likely to adopt? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've been thinking about this. I would say that this is absolutely true, what I said about reluctance to adopt new tools when, it's, when we're talking about social media. So it, it's difficult to like move people to Signal, for example, from WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger because the people they talk to are already on these tools and it's not just moving one person but like a community. Um, if we start to think about tools that might be special purpose, um, we didn't talk to anyone who mentioned this app, but I know in the past there have been discussions about ways being used. It's like a crowdsourced map system being used to like track law enforcement. Um, like I said, we didn't talk to anyone who used the, that app, uh, but possibly if there's like a specific utility in it, there could be some critical mass of people who spread the word in a, in a smaller community. Um, yeah, it's something to think about. I, I don't think it's impossible, but I would say it, it would be challenging. Um, I assume that the baby doesn't want to speak on microphone one, so I'm going to go to microphone three. Uh, I have two questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. The first one is kind of a nitty-gritty academic question, and that is, can you tell us anything about your IRB approval process, what you're doing to protect subjects' data, because this is very sensitive, and I'm curious how you've approached that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did have IRB approval before we spoke to anyone. Um, we actually got an exemption um, for collecting data about participants. So we compensated for each interview that we did. We gave uh, participants $20. Um, we were not required to collect any proof of payment. Um, we recorded the uh, interviews and encrypted them locally. Um, they were translated by people in our, our research group and then transcribed uh, with all identifying location and name data redacted. Um, and that, those were all stored, encrypted on our personal drives and then in a, a university drive. Uh, all the data has been deleted now, all of the original data as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, the other one is a big picture scatterbrain question, which is about how this is a technological solution to a political problem. Do you feel that uh, directing or, or helping immigrants understand how to protect themselves technologically is the answer or necessarily part of the answer, or do you feel like maybe eventually our community needs to be helping people exit places like the U.S. that are increasingly hostile to immigrants? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that helping people be more safe online is really a solution. I mean, the solution is going to be in policy and in law. Um, I think the utility really in the short term is like making sure people feel safe and like have more control over disclosure to the extent that they can, but I don't think that's going to, I, I don't think that's a winning, you know, single pronged battle. Um, as for leaving the United States, that's kind of a funny question considering how much people have sacrificed to come to the U.S. and especially having immigrated into communities already. Um, a lot of the people I spoke about today were long-term residents. I mean, everyone was a long-term resident, so they've sort of built their lives in the U.S. Um, but there has been a significant decrease in the number of people immigrating to the U.S. Uh, without authorization. Um, that's thanks to Obama-era policies of, like, you know, return immediately at the border. So whether people are now moving to other countries is a good question, um, and whether we should encourage that is, and I don't know, interesting. Thank you. Uh, microphone two. Hi. Um, so I have a question. Are there any initiatives to help um, the people in the way that so the fact that they don't um, they feel that they are less risk online and they don't perceive the risk as much? And do you feel that helping them understanding those risks? and maybe trying to be more secure online would actually help them? Or is their resignation towards the government uh, accurate? 
Um, if you're thinking about specific people, I think maybe when individuals' information is going to be accessible in the long run, if if immigration enforcement really chooses to, maybe that, that sense of resignation to some extent is accurate, but lots of people aren't necessarily on the radar. Um, and I think what's most beneficial about helping people understand how to use technology more effectively and like, that's really just increasing confidence. Um, it's this uncertainty and like choosing to abstain from participating in conversations because they just don't trust that they can be like private enough you know, or that their personal information, their home addresses, that they, they, they're still at risk of this harassment. Like, that's, that lack of confidence in privacy is really what I think can be helped. Um, and, oh, sorry, I had another point. Um, yeah, but if it's worthwhile, you know, thinking about how you can contribute to to helping, I mean, even even outside of like privacy work, a lot of people really just are eager to learn more about how to use technology, like to to help their lives. Um, right. So the other thing I was going to say was um, we also put significant thought into whether or not you know how to have these conversations with people and like how to ask questions about you know the risks online without really freaking them out um, because. We didn't really have solutions. It's not like at the end of an interview we could say like, well, we have a solution for you. Just install this app and you'll be safe. Um, so it's sort of this balance between making sure that people still, you know, use tools in the way that's so helpful for their lives, right? Like we don't want them to stop using Facebook if it means that they stop talking to their parents back in Mexico. We don't want them to stop using email if it means that they can't talk to their kids' teachers anymore. So it's this balance between like, being aware of the risk and being confident that you're doing as much as you can while not choosing to abstain. Um, so I'm hiding here in the corner because I'm trying to see whether somebody's at number four. There, there's somebody there? Yes. So mic four, please. Thanks. Uh, hi. So I was wondering, since Facebook is the most popular tool uh, that they use and they probably won't change it, did you find anything that the people at Facebook could do to help um, undocumented immigrants more? Yeah, I think, I think the things that Facebook can think about are really generalizable to a lot of vulnerable communities. Um, people, there were a few things in particular that some people were really uncomfortable with. Um, for example, WhatsApp, um, if you're added to like a group of people, your phone number is exposed to everyone else in the group. Um, without your consent, and, and that might be the case with like group SMS and things, but like the fact that WhatsApp even uses a phone number is kind of something that should we should migrate out of, right? Um, Facebook collecting phone numbers and collecting, you know, location data regardless of, of how easy it is to opt in and out. Um, and so this, this is primarily an academic work um, that's going to appear at the, at CHI, is a human computer interaction conference. And we talk a lot in the paper about um, what these bigger services can do. And really like we as a community can advocate for Facebook resisting cooperating with law enforcement, right? I mean, um, it shouldn't really matter to Facebook where you live or, or how you got there. They're a social media platform. They shouldn't be you know, helping immigration move people around physical borders they should they should be totally you know border agnostic um so advocating for that kind of uh attitude shift would be helpful um microphone two so thank you for the very interesting talk and i have a question that sort of, sort of um picks up on the previous one and because it's, you talked about it, Facebook has become such an important sort of a political actor in this, in this arena. I'm wondering if you've been following up on that as a sort of a research problem, like what's, what, is their, what is it that they are doing? And is this something that, that's happening unwittingly or is there something about the general strategy of Facebook that sort of helps create this kind of trust? And I'm also wondering, 
Go, taking that question further, sorry, it's more than a sentence. That mm -hmm. that if you're if 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 you've been thinking about this, if you see anything sort of suddenly eroding that trust in the future, and I'm specifically thinking about this now, this question about how it was possible for all this Russian uh, money to go into Facebook advertisements, and that sort of that's kind of point in the direction of pressure for Facebook to be less, less sort of general in, in, in their trust and picking up on certain on specific political issues, which could also be immigration, and disclosing some information that they already have. Um, to your question about whether there could be a shift in trust in the future, if something could trigger that, um, uh, the example in Detroit, right, where law enforcement was able to get a phone number from Facebook with a warrant and then track the person with his phone number. Um, if there are more and more cases of, of social media data being used in immigration cases, and there's, there's evidence to think that that might happen, um, it's possible that th that that narrative might overtake this sense that people have right now that Facebook's looking out for them by keeping their account, you know, theirs, that letting them control it. Um, in terms of Facebook picking up immigration as a, as a sort of an activist or a, or a political topic that they're interested in, I would not hold my breath on that one. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. So we have time for exactly one more question, and that is on mic one. Hi. Um, did you collect any uh, information or study anything about how um, the, um, these people were using financial services, uh, so things like online payments? Were the, did they have bank accounts? Were they concerned about their financial privacy? Yeah. Um, actually, people... The concerns they had with privacy in, in terms of the way that they were using like online banking, because people were, I mean, using credit cards and online banking and paying rent, you know, or utilities online. Um, they didn't talk about privacy much in that context, except that they have this concern about their, their financial information being stolen by hackers, right? Like the concern is for other people rather than the entities that are, that are providing these services. Um, and, and I think a lot of the concern there is coming from the fact that they have a lot to lose and very few legal protections should something bad happen to them. Um, but, yeah, so, so just generally, like, people were using online banking and had bank accounts and, and were using these online financial services. Some people were opting out, but it wasn't due to privacy concerns. It was because they were worried about using their credit card on the Internet. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I'd like um, you to help me thank our speaker, Allison, for this wonderful talk.